Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a hot and windy day all around San Diego, and firefighters are preparing for possible trouble. The victims of the attack in Benghazi are brought back to the U.S. Two of them were from San Diego. And bringing diverse groups of people together to help San Diego's wounded warriors. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. Today was hot and tomorrow is expected to be hotter. Cal Fire is beefing up its crews in response. Triple-digit temperatures were reported all around the county. The coast was only a little cooler than the inland regions, and high winds were blowing most of the day. The Weather Service is forecasting higher temperatures tomorrow. With a cool-down starting on Sunday, state fire personnel were already at maximum levels because this is the peak of fire season, but additional hand crews are now on duty just in case. Several brush fires are burning at Camp Pendleton right now. The Orange County Fire Authority says there are four of them and they are all controlled burns with no buildings threatened. The victims of Tuesday's attack on the U.S. consulate in Libya are back in the U.S. tonight. Their caskets arrived at Andrews Air Force Base this morning. U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens and three others were killed in the attack, initially linked to protests over an anti-Islam movie. President Barack Obama praised the four men as patriots. They loved this country, and they chose to serve it, and served it well. They had a mission, and they believed in it. Two San Diegans were among the dead. Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty, both former Navy SEALs, were working for a private security firm. Elite squads of U.S. Marines have arrived in Yemen and Tripoli. They're known as the Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Team, or FAST. This video is from a training exercise. They were deployed in response to protests outside other U.S. embassies in Yemen, Egypt, and Libya. The White House is sounding a new warning tonight about sequestration or deeper spending cuts next year if Congress can't compromise on how to reduce the deficit. A new report from the Obama administration says sequestration would be deeply destructive to national security, domestic investments, and core government functions. Most Pentagon programs would take a 9% cut. Sequestration would also mean cutbacks in the FBI, border protection, and air traffic control. The cuts also include college, financial aid, highway construction funds, and aid to disabled children. Now, the cuts are supposed to happen along with the end of the Bush-era tax cuts. A recent report says it could have an $11 billion impact on San Diego County. 100 local leaders went to Washington this week to urge Congress to do something about it. We'll hear from some of them on Evening Edition Monday. Escondido's police chief is on paid administrative leave because of a personnel investigation. Jim Mahar tells UT San Diego he was put on leave for his own protection because of a matter he reported to the city manager. City officials there are not talking about the investigation. Mahar has been chief there since 2006. His department has been criticized for using DUI and driver's license checkpoints. Latino activists say they're an attempt to target illegal immigrants. A campaign against synthetic drugs sent police into downtown El Cajon today. They're urging businesses to refuse to sell bath salt, spice, and other synthetic drugs. State law already forbids the sales, but the drugs can be altered just enough to stay legal. Even with the changes, police say the drugs are dangerous. Encinitas won't be voting on medical marijuana dispensaries this November. City Council is delaying the vote until 2014. Four other cities will vote this fall to create strict guidelines for dispensaries. They include Del Mar, Imperial Beach, Lemon Grove, and Solana Beach. Readers of the North County Times are wondering what to expect after the paper was sold to the owner of the UT San Diego. Amitha Sharma has this update. 
The San Diego region may have a budding media mogul in its midst. Doug Manchester, who bought the UT San Diego late last year, purchased the area's only other daily, the North County Times This Week. Voice of San Diego reporter Rob Davis joins us to talk about Manchester and the purchase. Rob, Manchester bought the North County Times for $12 million, more than what media analysts say it's worth. He told KPBS he hasn't ruled out buying any other media outlets. I know you've spoken to him, we've spoken to him. He says that he he wants his papers to be a, a cheerleader for business and, and the military, but you've interviewed him extensively. Do you sense that, uh, that there's an ulterior goal here? What's, what's driving him? Well, I mean, one of the things that's driving him is just simply the opportunity to make money. The UT is on valuable land in Mission Valley. He hopes to redevelop that. And he also, um, this is a guy who's been outside of the city's cultural establishment for decades. And he's now the city's most powerful media figure. Since Manchester took over the UT San Diego, he has run front page editorials endorsing San Diego mayoral candidate Carl DeMaio and uh, uh, advocating for a stadium to be, built, to be built at the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal. This past Sunday, he, read an he ran an editorial on the editorial pages that talked about what a second term with President Obama might look like. It wasn't necessarily grounded in the facts. How would you characterize all of of this and how is it playing with readers? Well, from the readers who are speaking up, it's not playing very well. Um, you know, he has articulated a very distinct vision of what he wants the newspaper to be, a cheerleader for local sports teams and the military and local businesses. And, you know, the very real question that readers need to be asking as they read the paper is how is that affecting the news coverage and, and where is the line between the editorial page and those things that you discussed being blurred with the straight ahead news stories that they're reading. And how does this open partisanship play as a business strategy for the paper? Well, when Platinum Equity bought it from the Copley family a few years ago, Jeff Light, who's the editor now, really pushed the editorial page away from being strident and doctrinaire. And he said that he wanted it to be more inclusive and have more voices. And Manchester has done the complete opposite. And so the um, Platinum did that, I think, as a way to attract more readers. And so it's sort of natural to expect that Manchester is kind of pushing some of those away. Now, we're talking about a paper that broke the story surrounding uh, the bribery scandal of former Congressman Randy Duke Cunningham. This is a paper that's traditionally held public officials accountable. Is there a risk that there might be damage to the brand if some of what we've seen already continues? Yeah, I mean, on the first day that they bought the paper, John Lynch told me he wanted the sports page, he's the CEO, he told me he wanted the sports page to call out opponents of a Chargers stadium as obstructionists. And anybody who's taken Journalism 101 knows that that's not the role of the sports page. And so that's the risk that they really face. Rob Davis, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thanks very much. The spirit of giving and local volunteerism is on display in a big way in Lemon Grove. That's where the home of a wounded warrior is being restored and upgraded for wheelchair access, all thanks to a nonprofit group called Embrace. They're redoing all the wiring in this three bedroom house in Lemon Grove to get it up to code, providing central air conditioning, a new bathroom and kitchen and they're installing concrete railings along with handicap ramps to make it easier for wheelchair users to get around. This is your, uh, your basement to the house, huh? Yeah. Mark Hupp and his wife have lived here for about three years. He's a Marine Corps veteran who served in Iraq until he was injured by an improvised explosive device in Fallujah. When I was hit initially, I, uh, I denied medevac and I kept working because I didn't, I didn't want to leave my team leader on his own. Um, but what came from that was it ended up damaging my back and my vision primarily, as well as some TBI, and, and later on ended up developing into post-traumatic post stress disorder. Pup eventually got involved with the Wounded Warrior Battalion. A friend of mine is in prosthetics. A guy comes in and says, hey, anybody need any work done on their home? He goes, yeah. You know, we use Mark's house as a meeting place. He's a combat wounded veteran. You know, see what you can do as far as a railing, and then it turns into this. 
Mark does a lot of entertaining here at, at his at his house, and most of his friends that come over happen to be disabled veterans who are wheelchair bound. Sean Shepard is the founder of Embrace, the nonprofit company behind the Healing Our Heroes Home Project. He says this is the fourth home to be restored in San Diego in the past year. It really does say a lot about Mark as a as a person to say, you know what? I really appreciate you doing work on my home, but can you help me with my friends that come here who are disabled? We got contractors and companies and organizations donating immense amount of material and labor. I mean, for my wife and I to, to do the things that are being accomplished in four days, it would take us 15 years. No thanks is needed. This is our way of saying thank you to him for all that he's done. He doesn't have to thank us at all. Shepard says about 100 student volunteers from San Diego State University will join other volunteers and contractors to complete the job this weekend. They also got support from Home Depot, McCarthy Building, and the Weingart Foundation. By the way, the founder of Embrace, Sean Shepard, says his father was a Vietnam combat vet and his grandfather served World War II in some small way. He says he feels like he's doing this to honor them. No TV blackout for the Chargers home opener. Uh, one day extension helped the team sell enough tickets for Sunday's game against the Tennessee Titans. A contract dispute is disrupting the harmony at San Diego's Orchestra Nova. Amitha Sharma has the story. No musicians have been hired at San Diego's Orchestra Nova, even though the upcoming season starts October 20th. Management is in contract talks with the local musicians union, but after five months, they've reached an impasse. KPBS arts reporter Angela Carone is here to tell us what's going on. Angela, what are the main points on which the Orchestra, Orchestra Nova management and the musicians union have reached an impasse on? Well, the salary is certainly part of it, as it is with orchestras all over the country, but what's different about what's happening here, um, Orchestra Nova would like to do away with a kind of standard contract that's always been in place, and that is when musicians sign on to work with Orchestra Nova, they sign on with a year or an annual contract um, that's renewable at the end of the year. And Orchestra Nova would like to do away with those contracts altogether. And so they basically want to sign on these musicians on a concert by concert basis. That's right. What is the reasoning behind this? Well, Jean Copac, the artistic director, wants to, as you say, hire musicians on a concert by concert basis based on their kind of stage persona and how it matches with the music being presented that night. What he wants to see is musicians who are willing to emote on stage, willing to show joy or sorrow or, and be expressive and show passion. He attributes this vision to the way forward, to saving how you could save the classical music industry, performance industry, um, which is struggling. I mean, there are not new audiences right now. I mean, the audience for classical music concerts are small, They're, they tend to be older, um, and something needs to be done. I mean, orchestras around the country are really struggling to stay afoot. So he, he thinks that you can compete with all of the other entertainment out there if you have musicians on stage who are showing emotion and who the audience can connect to. And has this approach been tried with orchestra orchestras elsewhere in the country? Well, it's, it's a fairly unique vision, and one of the reasons why it's unique is because musicians are actually not trained to perform this way. When they come up through conservatory and music schools, they're taught to blend in to the orchestra, right? To all work as one unit in the service of the music, to not emote, to you know, only move in this very, very clean, technical way to perform the music. And so this runs contrary to you years and years of training. And so it, it is a very unusual thing. I will say that, you know, there are orchestras all over the country trying different things. Some of them are, are doing very, are things like cutting back on musician salaries, right? This is happening all over the country. Um, actually cutting back the number of musicians in chamber orchestras. All of these things are being tried to make up for the financial situation that a lot of orchestras find themselves in.
So Zhang Ho Park has said that he will go outside the musicians' union if the impasse uh, isn't resolved. What's the available pool like? Well, so they meet one more time at the end of September. Both sides say that they think common ground can be reached. Um, if it cannot, then yes, the Orchestra Nova has said that they are willing to go outside of the union to find their musicians. The union says that in order to do that, that the classical musicians are actually really strong within the union. It's a 600 member union. And that going outside of that union would really degrade the quality of the orchestra and that audiences would actually see that. Angela Caron, thank you for speaking to us today. Thanks. Now at the beginning of this newscast, we told you the weather service is forecasting a hotter day tomorrow. A few records were set today, 103 in El Cajon and in Escondido, 101 in Ramona, 106 degrees, and uh, in Vista as well. County health officials are urging people to take advantage of cool zones throughout the county tomorrow. You can find locations online at coolzones.org. Here's a look at the forecast. The San Diego Opera's Words and Music program has kids writing operas. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando went to a rehearsal last month to see what it's all about. It's a hot summer morning in Barrio Logan. Students are gathering at the Barrio Logan College Institute for the San Diego Opera's educational outreach program, Words and Music. You guys, everybody, come on in so we can get you introduced. Give everybody a chance to meet everybody. What this is, of course, is the Words and Music program of San Diego Opera. And the kids here at Barrio Logan College Institute chose Diary of a Wimpy Kid by Jeff Kinney to set into a musical theater piece or a quasi-opera. Nick Ravellis is the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach. Cynthia Stokes is the teaching artist. San Diego Opera launched the Words and Music program in 2001 and the idea really was to create um, a program for students who generally weren't finding success in traditional ways in the classroom. Jose Cruz is the executive director of the Barrio Logan College Institute, one of the new and non-traditional organizations the opera works with the to Barrio reach students. Logan College Institute. Barrio Logan College Institute is an after-school program for local disadvantaged kids in the neighborhood to prepare them to be the first and their families to go to college. And what's unique about the program is that it starts in third grade and actually extends until college completion. So we continue to work with the kids until they finish college. It's important for the opera um, to involve kids and to involve anybody in the process of creating opera in order to understand it from the inside out. So what we did was we developed a program that would deal with music, reading, writing, adaptation, and also helping kids think about what it's like to be an artist, to actually stand in the shoes of an artist, particularly uh, an opera librettist and a composer. And I come in with Cynthia Stokes, and we, I teach the kids how to write the music to the libretto that she's teaching them to write. So during a residency that's generally 11 to 12 weeks long, students will compose and write all the lyrics, all the music, every single note to an original opera based on a familiar story that they know. Basically, Drive the Wimpy Kid is um, kind of like journal entries that Greg writes. Greg's the main character. You are witnessing the rehearsal, um, the ever wonderful rehearsal when the singers come and they meet the students. And students get to, to hear these voices, professional voices, sing their work. They rehearse um, everything we wrote. Um, and then they ask us questions like, do you like this? Do you want to make this louder? 
do you want to like stretch the words out? And so we just tell them what we want, what sounds better. What can the what can we as composers do and librettists do to make that super super clear? We like them to observe adults performing their work for them so that they understand that there's another level of creativity and that is interpretation. Is the adult performer singing and acting the lines that they've written and the music that they've created in the way that they intended? The, the, really the key idea here is that these young people create a work of art and they think about artistic intention and about how a work of art isn't a work of art until somebody actually views it. And that anything virtually can be sung and that singing a scene just lifts it up to a different place. It's a fun way of working. They're writing, they're composing, they're using their own ideas. And so a kid who traditionally will be the kind of kid who's got their head down on the table with their hoodie over their head is a kid who's not just sitting up but participating. Not just participating but suddenly leading the group. I normally don't participate a lot, but like when like when Stephanie I like, got here, you know, she introduced me to everyone, you know, and I actually started talking to everyone and I started getting involved more and even my coordinator noticed that and I think it's like really good. I like how you can actually express yourself in a word and put yourself like in the point of the character's view because you get to see your own creation come to life. We work really hard to make sure that we're supporting not only the visual and performing arts standards of the city schools and the school districts that we work in but uh, also standards like literacy, um, history, social sciences. We try and involve uh, little pieces of all of those standards in, in what we do with the kids. What we really like about the, about the partnership with the San Diego Opera is that it brings relevance to the academic support piece. I think it's, it's got a nice sense of just finding out where the boundaries are, breaking through the boundaries, what else can we teach, how much can we cover um, without being overwhelming. It's really fun. Take a bow. Clap it, clap it, clap it, clap it, clap it, clap it. And then you turn it, and then you go to the KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando. The next Words and Music session starts Monday at Eastlake High School. For more about the program, go to our website, kpbs.org. Recapping tonight's top stories, San Diego sweltered under triple-digit temperatures today, and the weather service is calling for hotter weather tomorrow. The only relief will be along the coast, where it's still expected to get into the upper 80s and 90s. A somber homecoming for the four men killed in Tuesday's attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya. Two of the victims were former Navy SEALs from San Diego. And Escondido's police chief is on paid leave tonight while the city conducts a personnel investigation. Jim Mahar says he was put on leave for his own protection after reporting an issue to the city manager. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend.